leads us into our next speaker, who is our keynote speaker, Sinead Gibney, who is the Chief Commissioner of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission. And um, she leads out on, on, on that, having been appointed by President Michael D. Higgins in July 2020. Sinead was the inaugural director of the commission between 2014 and 2016. Prior to this, she built and led Google's uh, corporate social response, responsibility function that we just heard about a while ago. Sinead also worked work for herself for a number of years for training, consultancy, media production to a range of organisations in the civil society and public sector. Sinead is a lifelong learner with an undergraduate degree in history from the University of Ulster, four postgraduate conferences. Uh, qualification, not one to worship before. And she's currently studying German. Um, so that, that's great. And the former chair of the board of one family and has served on a number of other boards, including the Digital Charity Lab, Victims' Rights Alliance, and the EU's Responsible Research and Innovative Innovation Industry Advisory Group. So, with that in mind, you're very welcome to the stage. for the, the very warm introduction and it's really wonderful to see you all here today. I want to start by saying I'm on the tail end of an ear infection so I've been getting slagged all week by my family that I'm talking like I've got headphones on so apologies in advance but more importantly if I'm not speaking loud enough do let me know. Um, and for that reason as well I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave at lunchtime today. I had hoped to stay for the full event but I've had to shift a whole load of stuff around this week so I was never going to miss today because this topic is so dear to my heart and something that I'm really passionate about. Um, but I'm afraid I won't be able to stay for the afternoon. As David mentioned, as, and as you've heard from my profile, I, I worked here at Google for nearly eight years. I left uh, over eight years ago, so I know we're talking today about rehabilitation for prisoners, but I am living proof that there is also rehabilitation after Google, just for any Googlers out there, you can leave. Um, so just to put that out there as well. And a huge thanks to Google and to David for hosting us uh, this morning. And thank you to Gashka and the Department of Justice and Working to Change program for inviting me to speak today on behalf of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission and to be a part of what I know will be a day of commitment to our shared human rights and equality values. It's really encouraging to see so many different groups and individuals here representing the criminal justice sector, educators, employers, NGOs and community-based organisations all here today for a common purpose. So in my time, I'm going to cover the public sector duty, and I'm going to talk about some examples of it in practice, and I know the public sector duty will be familiar to many of you. I'll then talk a bit about COVID, and we've heard about this already, but really what it has meant for prisoners and their families. I'd then like to recognize those who've contributed to the protection and promotion of prisoner rights through your work, just like we strive to do in IREC. And I'll finish by talking about the importance of decent work, the opportunity for employers and specifically some comments on disclosure. But first, I'd like to wish a warm welcome to those people who are watching from within the Irish prison system. And as you've heard, some of today's speeches and discussions will be available for you to access. And I want to say what a privilege it is to be given the opportunity to speak directly to you as we discuss here today, not just the challenges that you face both within and outside the prison system, but also the opportunities and prospects available to you and the best way for everyone here today to work together for your benefit, dismantling the barriers that you face and reflecting on what part we all play in helping you to secure a positive future for you and your families. The public sector equality and human rights duty puts a statutory obligation, and that's an important word, a statutory obligation on public bodies to eliminate discrimination, promote equality of opportunity and protect the human rights of those to whom they provide services and to their staff when carrying out their daily work. It means that equality and human rights are central to the way that public bodies execute their functions, including in the prison and probation services. Implementing the duty helps those public bodies to take a proactive approach to tackling equality and human rights issues. And the approach that we put forward is to assess, address and report. By assess, we mean that every public sector body must set out in its strategic plan an analysis of the human rights and equality issues relevant to their functions and purpose. To address a public sector body must set out in its strategic plan the policies, plans and actions in place or proposed to address those issues and then crucially it must implement those plans. 
and to report, and that means that every public sector body must account for the developments and achievements in its annual report. So how does this apply to the criminal justice sector and the issues that we're here to discuss today? Well, at IREC, we undertook a pilot project at the, at the outset with six public bodies to investigate how they were implementing the public sector duty. And both the Irish Probation Service and the Irish Prison Service took part in that pilot programme and worked with staff and service users to uncover the key issues affecting all staff and prisoners. And today I'd like to share some of the details of the Irish Prison Services pilot. The then Director General of the Irish Prison Service made the crucial point that Although prisoners were incarcerated as a punishment, they were not there to be punished. Rather, our prison system is meant to rehabilitate, to support and encourage prisoners, to empower them, so that when they leave, they can become positive and successful members of society. It was evident, though, very quickly that there were many equality challenges in the two prisons in the pilot, Docus and Limerick Women's including specific women's issues and issues involving members of the Traveller and Roma community, the LGBTQI plus people and older people. The three key values that emerged when reflecting on the Irish Prison Service's commitments to human rights, equality and the role of the duty were dignity, recognising difference and compassion. In practical terms, it then meant hearing what each individual's personal thoughts were on the issues under discussion. For example, one docus woman prisoner, Siobhan, said, it was great. We all mixed together, prisoners, staff, medical. Everybody had their say on the duty and everyone was on the same side. Everyone wants the best for everyone in, in here. And I think it's really powerful to hear those words. Everyone is on the same side. Everyone wants the best for everyone within the prison system. In Limerick, the discussions revealed that the main issues for women prisoners were education, families and health. For the staff, concerns involved gender-specific training, support and supervision, and everyone had concerns about rehabilitation and the complaint system. The resulting improvements included supporting connection with families, enhancing education opportunities, and improving communications and complaints mechanisms. From my experience, this is just the start. Organisations who truly embrace the duty understand quickly the magnitude of how transformational it can be and how far reaching into the structures and processes of your organisations human rights and equality truly go. The years of the COVID pandemic were difficult for all of us, but people within the prison system were particularly adversely affected. The prison service, staff and prisoners all worked hard to keep the number of COVID cases as low as possible and globally Ireland was heralded as a model for success, including the submission of a paper to the World Health Organization. But while the infection control element was undoubtedly a success, the resulting isolation and the limitation of prisoner liberties was devastating for the prison population and their families, particularly in terms of mental health. And some of these issues remain today. It's vital that we learn from the response to the pandemic and assess together what needs to be done to ensure that human rights and equality obligations are met for prisoners and for prison staff, even in the midst of a crisis. This is one of our strategic priorities set out by IREC this year to future proof for crises so that the voices of those most adversely affected are amplified the next time around. It's often said that every person needs just one positive role model in their life to become successful and fulfilled. Just one person who believes in you who supports and encourages you can make a dynamic difference. And today I'd like to thank and compliment all those prison officers and probation officers who've done just that. Your work can be difficult and challenging. With your support, your encouragement and mentoring, lives are changed and better futures realized. It's both a challenge and a privilege to be in such a position. And I urge you all, to carry that responsibility with integrity and determination. Encouraging prisoners to enrol in education projects, to study or undertake training courses, and then to support them while they do it is central to the rehabilitation process. And a fundamental pillar of both human rights and equality is participation, nothing about us without us. So it's important to ask prisoners, what do you need to progress? What are the obstacles you face on a daily basis and how else can you be supported 
within the prison system and when you exit. I had the privilege of hearing about some of these issues from a former prisoner a few years ago, and he told me that life with a prison record was like walking with a pebble in his shoe. Simple things that we all take for granted were so much more challenging for him. He experienced constant irritants and difficulties which made rehabilitation incredibly difficult. He spoke about having two sentences, the one that's handed to you by the courts and the one that stays with you for life. Because we know that access to meaningful employment is crucial for those leaving prison, but often former prisoners find that the real battle begins when they leave the prison system and attempt to find meaningful employment in society. And while companies like Google, who seek to actively support the recruitment of ex-prisoners, are to be commended, there's much more that Google and all employers can do in this area. You can review and fix systems to ensure that there are no algorithmic biases, you can tackle stigma to ensure those same biases are rooted out of your workforce. You can use clear, inclusive language when advertising so that people don't deselect themselves before the process even begins. And you can actively support initiatives such as the Gashka Awards that are available to prisoners. Employers need to see ex-prisoners as eminently employable, an untapped talent pool. The determination and resilience that many prisoners show as they undertake a training scheme or degree course while in prison cannot be overstated. Believe me, you want these people on your payroll. Also, as we support ex-prisoners back into the workplace, it's important that we don't pigeonhole them into occupations or employments that they are unsuited for. Underemployment is a huge issue for prisoners and other groups such as asylum seekers who face barriers to employment. We all have specific talents and interests, and we are at our best when we get the chance to excel at them. And then there's the issue of disclosure, to tell or not to tell. Supposedly, a person does the crime, then does the time, and that's it. The slate is wiped clean, except in certain situations. You're free to begin again, your sentence served. Except, of course, we all know that's not how it works. The stigma of a prison sentence can weigh heavily on a person. Discrimination, particularly by potential employers against ex-prisoners, can often be the factor contributing to recidivism. As a commission, we've spoken publicly and given advice to Oireachtas members that a more inclusive spent conviction scheme with increased sentence thresholds and a review mechanism for more serious offences would significantly help offenders' rehabilitation and reintegration into society. We've also been clear that Ireland's equality legislation needs to be changed to include discrimination on the ground of criminal conviction. Such a change in law would reflect the impact a criminal conviction can have on someone's life when accessing employment, housing, education and services like insurance even decades later. While honesty is usually the best policy, different contexts apply and it's vital that ex-prisoners are supported to feel confident about disclosure if it is required and coached to emphasise what they've achieved since their conviction, their motivation and commitment to employment, and why they can be a positive asset to any employer. I'd like to finish by quoting Nelson Mandela, who know, knows more about or knew more about him, imprisonment than most. And he said, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this quote, but it really, I, it really touches me, no one truly knows a nation until one has been inside its jails. A nation should not be judged by how it treats its highest citizens, but its lowest ones. Human rights are by their essence universal, and prisoners have the same human rights as all other people. And we all have our part to play in society to protect and promote them. I look forward to the discussion today, which will allow us to do just that. Thank you. You haven't invited me on the podcast yet. Well, you're definitely coming. But thanks for it. Very passionate as well. You know, and I can see when you're uh, speaking about certain sectors and organisations and departments, the eyes are cast it over in those directions too, which is always good. But um, I was interested, you spoke about kind of ethnic groups and their experience. Would you tell us, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the reality is that uh, there are specific challenges faced by people in prison and who've been in prison. 
We talk a lot about intersectionality. My team asks me not to say that word because it excludes people, but it, I think it's so important because people who are Roma, for example, and prisoners have a totally different experience. People who are LGBTQI plus have a different experience again. And what that means is that there are specific barriers that they face and specific solutions that they need to face. And I know the IPRT has done some really interesting research in this area around specific groups and how the prison experience impacts them. But it can be so much more challenging because things are compounded when you have the difficulties that are faced by being a member of one group, but then also having the experience of something like a prison sentence. And then we have, of course, the overrepresentation of certain groups in prisons. There was some really groundbreaking research produced by the University of Limerick uh, called the Irish Travellers Access to Justice Project, which spoke about the overrepresentation of Irish travellers in prisons. And it really is just shocking to hear the experience. And I think it's really important. Now, they focused on more the, the, the interaction with the guards and the courts rather than the prisons themselves. But you know, I think a lot of people in Irish society have a particular re relationship with the guards and we view the police service and the guards Shikona as a really positive force and obviously during COVID it was a really, it really excelled. But I think it's so important to remember that that experience is not shared by everyone. That if you're born an Irish traveller, you have a totally different perception of an interaction with the guardie. And it starts from a really negative point, so you can't then just say, well, you know, we all have the same, it's not equality on that basis, you have to acknowledge that people are starting from those different points. There was a, a case in Cork there a few years ago where the traveller lady went into the guard station to get passports for herself and her kids, the child was two, and the, that child was put on the pulse system because it was profiling basically, but somebody called the woman and she won a civil case, you know, so that's the thing, type, type of thing you're up against there. And uh, like we've grown up with travellers in our neighbourhood, you know, um, but I only really understood the pride of a traveller when I got married. My, wife, my wife's a traveller and uh, you know, like if you're in a social setting and somebody drops the keyboard, you know, and I feel it, which I know she feels yeah. it, you know, but that's it's still an acceptable form of racism. Yeah. Oh, I think, I mean, racism against Irish travellers is still the accepted form and the bigotry that exists is, is just huge and I, I don't think people reflect on enough, enough on, on our own attitudes. I mean, I really encourage people to just, uh, to know travellers in your lives and to know, like, I mean, that's, you know, uh, uh, we talk about bias. The only way you can break down bias, really, I believe, is by exposure. Like, by really knowing people and, um, and getting to know and uh, breaking down what are those assumptions and those stereotypes that we all hold. And the travellers I work with and that I've been proud to know are just the most incredibly talented, committed, and just, it, they have such integrity. And against decades of discrimination, continue to hold their heads high and articulate their experience against just just continued discrimination and suffering. When I was growing up as a young lad, um, our area was destroyed from alcohol, drugs and crime, joinery and all sorts. And I grew up, there was me and my two younger siblings and my mother. My mother had her own issues around her mental health. But the local halt site was somewhere where I felt more connected than everywhere else and, and I would have from a young young age had most of my friends would have been travellers because they accepted me and because I wasn't so much accepted. You know, we were very, very poor and and um, there was a lot of different things going on in the household but like I got to know their culture on a personal level and they became like I've got kids now who are who travel kids because and I still have a relationship with them but in a positive way today. Whereas before it was it was quite different, but they were, once once you get to know them, they're some of the nicest uh, people that you could possibly meet. It's just they're so used to being put down yeah. and told that they're this and that and the other that you become hard in the exterior and you have this exterior image that stay away and they just act a certain way. But we, they think everybody's gonna hurt them or give out to them or say this or that. And their reaction is, it, it, it can be negative towards people before they even say something because they're more, more or less used to it. You know, I think, um, e like even the in- The mental health challenges, I mean, I, I was at the protest recently um, for progression of the mental health um, action plan for travelers. And I was actually really saddened by, there was just not as much people as I would have hoped to see there. And I was talking to some of my 
uh, my colleagues and, and people who work in the sector, and they're saying like people are just bent down at this stage. Like just there is, it's just been so hard. But the reality, like the stark reality, is that if you're born a traveller, you have lower chances of, you have a, a lower life expectancy, you have poor outcomes in terms of health, education, employment, every single area. It just is a panoply of dis discrimination um, and, uh, and, and human rights violations, it really is, and, and we, have to, we have to do more. Absolutely, absolutely. So over the last five or six years there, um, there's been a big recruitment drive at the IPS for recruiters and officers. And uh, part of the training, myself and Sheila Conley from the Cochrane Centre, we deliver a module to a different group every month. Um, so it was just about, uh, I suppose, so they have a better understanding when they go into the job of the backgrounds of some of the prisoners on the landing. So hopefully there's a bit more of an understanding, a bit more compassion, yeah. and you know, a bit of a critical awareness as to the context of the crime, you know, and that should you know, help the, the environment. So, so, so that has went on for a few years. So recently I was in Cork Prison and uh, we do an addiction studies course and, and we deliver that in the prison and I never told the prisoners about this training but they remarked about the new recruit officers being like sound and very approachable and they have a chat with you as opposed to the old stock but then I was in another prison that I won't name because I don't want to, you know, it's negative like but uh, I was giving a talk in, in, to about 50 prisoners in the chapel and they had very bad things to say about the officers well there was officers present in the room and I'm trying to acknowledge it but not get into it with them because they're trying to get invited back in to do another talk. <laughs> because there's an element that we have to work within the system to change the system as well, you know? But, um, like uh, even shaping today's talk now, like it's it's hard for me, but like because I want to encourage and I acknowledge the difficulty and the challenges faced by people in the prison service and the probation service, but I also feel very strongly about prisoner rights and that as a state we're not doing enough to defend and protect and promote those rights. So it is hard to get the funds right one, in the campaign. One of the big things that they spoke about was some of the longer from prisoners, they were all kind of longer from prisoners, but some of them because of the certain offence they don't they are stopped from doing certain education courses, you know. Yeah. Have you come across that in your report? No, I haven't actually. I mean, there may have been specific cases uh, that the legal team would have taken, but I wouldn't be familiar with all of them. Like, you know, long term section 15A, drug sale and supply, there's certain uh, courses they're not allowed okay. to do, you know. But like, if we really believe in people's ability to change, we have to back them with the, the education and don't stop them. Because then it's like, yeah, we believe in your ability to change, but we're not allowing your own course because we actually don't really believe in your ability to change, you know. Yeah. You have reservations about your ability to change even though you're in here for the last 12 or 13 years and we're after working closely by you, we still don't really believe in you. And that's what you're telling them when you stop them from doing the course, you know. So like education is for all prisoners or for no prisoners, you know. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. And, and also just, I mean, I feel like mental health has come so much in the last couple of decades in terms of removing stigma, being able to talk about mental health in a positive way. We haven't yet as a society got there with addiction. I know in certain communities and I know how closely the connection is between crime, prison and addiction, but I don't think more broadly we talk enough about addiction. I've been nearly 11 years sober myself. I gave up um, on New Year's Eve 2011. Well done. Thank you. All of us. <laughs> Many of my friends wouldn't consider me an alcoholic, but I'm a problem drinker, there's no question. I have just... I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't have achieved what I've achieved uh, if I hadn't done it. So I'm such a powerful believer in what we can contribute to society when we are post-addiction, when we are post-recovery, and when we are post-prison. We've learned so much about ourselves. Our self-awareness is so high, and I think it's so important that people share all of those experiences because addiction isn't just about the very extreme cases and the very extreme drugs. It's just pervasive in our society, and we, we have it in every family in Ireland. We need to start talking about it more freely. Do you know, in the disclosure, you spoke about the disclosure of crimes. There's a lot of businesses here. What is the best way for, for somebody to disclose their crimes? Like, is there a subtle way of doing it? Because I've been in a few interviews, and, and, and I've had to mention some of the stuff that I've, I've been involved in in the past. Like, it's the most... It, it's like I just want the ground just to open and swallow me because you're going back into the, the actual experiences and you're talking about and, and for me it feels like 
when talking about a completely different person because that person had no awareness back in the day because all I was doing is the same things that I was taught growing up you know, the things that I looked at all the other lads doing in front of me they were my, my role models were guys in front of me who were in prison, who were selling drugs, who were involved in crime who were tough men and they had respect from the area, from people in the area so, like for me, and then I have years of recovery of therapy and, and meditation behind me, and I, I'm sitting there, and it's like I feel so shit, and it brings yeah. me back into those times when, you know, when when I'm sitting in the cell and I'm waiting to go to prison or, or things like that, and there's so much shame around it, yeah. you know, and fear. What, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think for me the most important part is law and um, so at the moment there's a, a review happening of the equality legislation by the Department of Equality, um, Minister O'Gorman, and he's looking at the introduction of new grounds. So we're looking at, for example, socioeconomic as a new ground, which is huge and it's going to be massive if and when it comes and we're pushing very hard for that. But we're also pushing for criminal conviction to be a specific ground under which you cannot discriminate. And that to me is where we need to be at because then you have that backstop of all of the situations you're describing. Um, I think on an individual basis, coaching yourself and accessing coaching to, to speak proudly about your past and experience, to balance it with what you've learned from them is always really important and that's what I was trying to set out uh, in my talk today. But I do think as well employers have to take the responsibility, even before that law exists, that they shouldn't discriminate either and find ways and build systems because they build beautiful systems here in Google, I know that. <laughs> to Like for example, I, like I worked in Northern Ireland when I was very young and the FEC up there had a process at the time where you submitted your uh, personal details about religion and um, politics separately to your application. Like perhaps there's a way that employers can do that where there's a safe uh, submission that's separate to your actual general application that's housed by one person who can make a decision on whether or not it has any influence on your application, any material influence, and if it doesn't, you shouldn't then have to disclose it, because you are disadvantaging yourself by bringing it into the room if you know it's going to send you back, as you've described, and you right back to that place. Like, so uh, there's lots of different ways I think we can tackle it and we can be creative about doing so. And we'd also welcome class to be added to the grounds. Oh, to yeah, so it's economic, yeah. But I want to talk to you about spent convictions before we should finish up. So. I suppose the, the, the things that happen, the main thing in these lives, and a lot of some of the people in their own lives, they kind of shape who you are, and they, they bring it to here today. And would you change any of it? There's some regrets there, but it's kind of more than a sense of who we are. Uh, we all that wisdom, and then we can help the next generation. So, with spent convictions, is there a piece of um, we need society to understand that this is a part of who we are? We can't you know, wipe that clean because it's, it's actually part of who you are in the family context and the social context. Or would you be more on the society kind of accepting people with convictions or more on the government looking to kind of wipe convictions off and kind of support to spend convictions a little bit more comprehensively? Well, I suppose our mandate would be to look at both areas. I personally think greater change has to happen in, in a legal basis and the state has a broader responsibility to do it. And I know obviously Senator Ruan and Ruan has just done amazing work and promoting this within the Oireachtas and other parliamentarians as well who are pushing for it. But that to me is crucial, that, that you shouldn't have it hanging over you for the start. Changing society is a much bigger, I think, and longer term project and it's not something we should shy away from. I think it's something we should all be playing a part in and our organisation has a role to do that for sure and, and great work done by IPRT and uh, some of the other uh, organisations in the sector. Uh, but for me, how we can just set those hard and fast laws and rules in place, firstly, is crucial and that's what uh, politicians need to do, policy makers. Excellent, excellent. And in terms of the the display of convictions, but as well that the Noir and Shangham has chosen on, you know, having uh, drug offences classified as minor offences like road traffic and public auto. So after seven years, they don't show up, they're considered spent. That would have a huge impact on a lot of people because a lot of people are in prison because of a drug or alcohol addiction, you know. Yeah. So, um, but we definitely welcome that uh, from the government. And legalisation as well, looking towards legalisation because, you know, I mean, if we look around the world, I was in New York recently, it's a different city at the moment, like it's just. There's such a different attitude toward drugs, and we have to catch up as a society and, and get there. So if the government wanted to give us a grant to go to New York to do some research, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Jeanette. Yeah, we can talk back there. Absolutely. <laughs>